Hi everyone, welcome back to Tokyo on Fire. It is March 27th, 2018. In an astounding move, the president imposed tariffs on $60 billion worth of trade between China and the United States, and also a basket of other tariffs, which includes those imposed on Japan. Michael, this is a slap in the face to Prime Minister Abe, wouldn't you say? No, Mr. Abe is, I, if he weren't completely occupied right now with the Moritomo Gakuen scandal, would have to deal Steam. with the flowing out. Yeah, steam, fire, whatever it is that is, his, his hair is on fire right now, and he's lucky he has hair to have on fire. You know, but, but he, he did bring this golf club that was made in China. Yes, and it was a very expensive one, and, and he flattered the president and has gone to visit him and has made every effort, that, including turning head over heels literally for him at the golf course. Right. <laughs> uh, and... Many people thought that this was a masterful way for him to defend Japan's interests and in, in many ways buy the affection of Donald Trump, which seemed to be the only way to control events mm -hmm. in Washington. But that doesn't seem to have worked out entirely so well. No. America first, yeah. Ambassador Orr? Well, I think that's exactly, I think what Michael says is exactly right. I mean, <clears throat> this, is, this was a strategy that he embarked upon soon after the election. And uh, that was flattery and playing to President Trump's massive ego. And it doesn't appear to have worked out especially as it relates to this tariff. Well, this isn't a shot in the dark. Something like this doesn't come up <clears throat> over a weekend or a couple of weeks. This is a massive change in, in policy shift that, that impacts very negatively you know, U.S. trade, but it, it hopefully is going to turn things over so that the United States produces more, that the United States gets more. Well, that's the story that that's Mr. The story, Trump, right? but, but the, the reality is, is going to be uh, a far more painful. Retaliation, maybe? Yeah, uh, definitely. I mean, we're going to be paying, and this is why the, the, the shareholders on Wall Street are, are in a sense of a panic right now, because they don't know which direction this is going, because, you know, they're worried about the hike in interest rates in the United States, and then this is combined with it. So, you know, this is a critical situation. Right. Yeah. What do you think about uh, the president's comment? You know, they will, be, they will be smiling to themselves. How could we have gotten so much for so little over these last couple of years? It's about time for the United States to wake up. I think he's in dreamland. <laughs> um, I think that, that anyway, m many of the industries that he's moved quickly to, to protect and to promote are dying industries. Coal, really? Mm -hmm. uh, steel. Um, and, and I think that, 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 for example, in China, with their emerging massive solar energy uh, industry, they have to be jumping up and down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Will tariffs work? I don't think they will at all. They never, they rarely do. It's, it's, it, it, occasionally you see them work in selected areas. Uh, we saw uh, economic sanctions, for example, which are a form of tariff for many often. Uh, they worked pretty well in South Africa mm -hmm. uh, at the, during the, at the, before Mandela came back. And uh, so, but it, it normally doesn't. It normally doesn't. So I, it's, a, I think, a mistaken approach. With regard to the Chinese, though, the, the logic here is that they have been violating intellectual property. They've been riding on the United States. They're producing tablets and iPhones that are, are you know, just uh, counterfeit. Uh, uh, counterfeit, right? Yeah. Well, I, I think that there is a problem with China trade in that respect. Mm -hmm. um, I just don't think it really relates to the steel industry. Uh, and I think, it, therefore, this can be a lot more select. I, I am not aware of any high-level negotiations that have gone on. In, re in recent time, I, I, you know, day-to-day -day negotiations happen all the time. Um, but I, you know, I mean, and then you have the president, on the one hand, you know, paying lip service to the president Xi, uh, even saying that he they had a good visit, didn't they? You know, they had a great visit. You know, they got President Trump saying he wouldn't mind a lifetime presidency. So I mean, th this stuff doesn't really help. Uh -huh. um, and um, and I think we're going to pay a price for it. Mm -hmm. The Japan focus there is, you know, what did Abe, what was Abe supposed to do to make yeah. make Trump happier? What what was left? He really, really abnegated himself. And 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 some people, very few, uh, criticized him for being the pochi, the dog mm -hmm. of of Donald Trump. But most people in Japan saw that Japan had no alternative, mm -hmm. uh, and that a long term ally that has gone the distance, unlike let's say Angela Merkel in, in, in Germany, who she's not in any way bent even a centimeter in the direction of Donald Trump and his massive ego, uh, in fact, has in fact pushed back against mm -hmm. it. Uh, Mr. Abe did the exact opposite. 
uh, has been has been basically a supplicant and and and, and sweet talking Donald Trump, that Japan, in order to force Japan to into a bilateral uh, agreement, and of course this is people lower down who are telling the president this is the only way we can do it. You know, you you can, the only way to proceed is through intimidation and force. Mm -hmm. uh, that Japan is left off the list of allies who are exempt from the steel tariff, whereas uh, South Korea, because it's w been willing to play ball, uh, is going to get off. Uh, and, and they're going to, be, it, it seems that they have some deal, maybe even on chorus, uh, mm -hmm. the Korea-US uh, trade uh, negotiations that Mr. Trump also wants to renegotiate. Uh, the, 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 uh, the, the idea that of, of America first truly as the America is not a benign hegemon, but an intimidating, tough guy with big shoulders right. and, and, and saying, we have a big market and you want access to it, and if you're gonna, you have to pay a, a huge price. There's always been a price, though. Yeah. And you know, one of the things, I can think of a certain thing that cannot irritate the Japanese anymore, and that is... Surprise. That, surprise always. And, and, but the other thing is, they're not included with the group of Europeans they're the outliers. Japan mm -hmm. is the outlier. Even the Korean, Japan is the outlier. And that is something that really gets under their skin. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that wasn't considered right. when this decision went forward. Well, I can give you a good answer to that one. All the people who are Japan hands exactly. signed the letter that I will never serve for You're Trump. Right. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that, so there are no Japan hands in his, uh, in his yeah. circle, as it's it true. were. Uh, I don't think there's no there's an inner circle aside from his family, but for the people who hover around yeah. him are have virtually no knowledge mm. or con contact with Japan. Was that an effective letter? Was that tactic? I mean, we've got another letter that's that's uh, in circulation or about to be published. Yeah. Isn't that right? Well, the letter that, that they're, they're quite different. I, well, I think Michael's referring to is the letter in which about fifty or so or more. Um, former foreign policy authorities in previous administrations have said they would never sign in a, 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 a work for a Trump administration. And I think we have some mutual friends who are on that who I wish they were they hadn't done that, to be honest with you, because mm -hmm. I, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think we need them. They're excluded now, yeah. Yeah, because I think we need them. And I personally think that the letter was a mistake, but, but I understand the, why they did it because of their commitment. To, mm -hmm. uh, the other letter, of course, refers to the um, the the uh, two hundred ambassadors plus, uh, and it refers That's amazing. Well, it refers to the nomination of Pompeo as the Secretary of State, and what those two hundred plus of which I am also a signatory on that uh, basically are are saying these are the kinds of questions that Pompeo needs to worry about, not. You know, and one of the big ones is the whole collapse of the State Department personnel mm -hmm. situation. And so I think that that's that particular letter there, and that's very critical. That must be a really powerful letter. I mean, even you yeah. said yourself, you know, you're you're kind of on the bottom of the list. You were the longest serving ambassador yeah. in, in the Obama administration. Right. And still comparatively you're saying, you know, there there are guys there that hold hold a, a far larger torch than than I do. So it must be oh, a, yeah. a, a tremendous letter. Yeah, I mean, and of course, the, the way these things are signed, it, you know, it's not whether how long you were there or anything like that. It's sure. Just whoever gets the email and <laughs> signs <laughs> up, right? But but no, I mean, it is it, an impressive list, though. It's a it's a remarkable list, and right. it includes Republicans and Democrats, and it, it also has career and non career people. I was a non career ambassador, and and mm -hmm. it's very very impressive. And these they're very serious, and they're very worried. When will when will it be published? I'm not sure yet. I mean, I got this, uh, this just month? yesterday. I just got it yesterday, oh. and there's already over 200 signed. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll go to the the Senate. It's it's addressed to to the chairman and the and the minority of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and the hope is that there will be you know some questions generated from the letter. It'll hit the press. I, I don't know. I really mm -hmm. don't know how that's going to be handled, but. Uh, uh, I know that I <clears throat> I couldn't present it to the press uh, today because it's not completed. Mm. Yeah, you know, we're coming out of the ADB where you served for for yeah. six years, uh, shifting gears and, and from from a business span, standpoint and an investment and a development and a, and a finance standpoint, mm -hmm. to putting aside the political security line. You know, how is this read uh, in? Well, first of all. 
in the in the institutions of e, of East Asia, not only the ADB but yeah. uh, uh, ASEAN and and all the other capitals. Well, how would they be seeing this? Well, it, the fact of the matter is is that the the current administration is opposed to international organizations. But not not indifferent. They're, he's opposed. Uh, doesn't believe in them. Mm -hmm. So what it translates into is I left my post, you know, uh, January twenty sixteen. Um, and there's been there was an interim ambassador for seven months, who was fired the minute that Trump became president, mm -hmm. and that was a year January twenty of twenty seventeen, and there has not even been somebody nominated in that over one year period, not even nominated. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and that's not only ASEAN is the same. Uh, all of these international work, we have fifty. Ambassadorial posts that are not filled today, right now. And many of them don't even have anybody nominated. There's nobody nominated for South Korea yet. We had one yeah. in the pipeline, he, an excellent man. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, we, we focused on that in, in an earlier episode of Tokyo on Fire. Yeah, it's, it's, it's shameful. Mm -hmm. uh, but the thing is, for Japan, because it's not a military power, it has always used international organizations as a absolutely. huge leverage, a way right. of leveraging up its, its, its influence internationally. Absolutely. And not having the United States there with them, specifically because they're both the top shareholders at the ADB. Exactly. And, and other, they, they have the same approach to all the other international organizations. Abe's on his own here. Mm. I agree with you, and and you know, I mean, I, I've talked to the the leadership of the of the ADB, and I, I it's the first question I get. I was there two weeks ago uh, in, in in Manila. It's the first question I get. So who's who's going to be who's coming out here? And I said, you know, I call the president of the ADB. I call him Sosai, the Japanese word for it. And I say, Sosai, I wish I could tell you, uh -huh. I'm out, I'm out of the loop, you know, uh -huh. on this. And uh, yeah, it's a problem, and, and, and you're absolutely right. I mean, the Japanese do use international organizations. They don't like the blunt bilateral approach mm -hmm. if they can avoid it, you know. And they're, by and large, fairly effective. You know? uh, mm. So it's a problem, Pro problem for them. Can we get back to the tariffs? Mm, sure. How is it, with the first meeting between the United States and Japan after President Trump became elected, it was an economic dialogue with the Minister of Finance in the United States, Treasury Secretary. You remember in, in Tokyo they had this economic dialogue. How after that, after Davos, can we have a tariff that just kind of comes up almost as if an ambush? I mean, with everything that's going in place, people need to know that. Wasn't this pretty much an, an ambush, Michael? Well, I, I cannot begin to understand the Trump administration because there's it, it's just basically uh, who spoke to Donald Trump last, what he saw on Fox News. Right. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's not, it, 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 there's no process that we can identify. So I, I do respect uh, Mr. Abe's effort to try to get some handle on this completely uh, runaway train that's mm -hmm. going on in the United States, but we have to admit it's a runaway train. And for Japan, that's been very difficult mm -hmm. to adjust to because the United States is so important and in this case, being on the other, again, being isolated and ostracized and having the Koreans and the Europeans as friends with, with, with mm -hmm. at least in terms of the tariff exemptions, uh, that's, that must be killing. Uh, yeah. But, but in, in terms of the Japan's institutions, Inside the, inside the government, I'm sure there are people at, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs who are looking at the Kante and saying, told you, uh -huh. told you, yeah. shouldn't have gone, shouldn't have put it right. all that effort in, yeah. because I'm sure they said, don't go, mm -hmm. don't, don't sell yourself out for this person, because he's, he's, you know, look, you know, he's, he's faithless. And, yeah. and I'm sure they were, they, that's what they were doing. You know, it reminds me, I, I, when, he, when, the, uh, when Abe went to see Trump immediately after the election, I was... I was very unhappy, as I mentioned. And I had dinner with a good friend of mine from the foreign, foreign ministry, and I kind of lit into him a little bit. And I said, how can you guys in the Gaim show? He, said, he just looked at me and he said, he said. It wasn't uh, our call. He said, uh, yeah. Kante Geico. 
Yeah. Conte <laughs> Geico. That's all he said. I said, ah, Prime Minister's yeah. residence, foreign policy. Yeah, I get it. Yep. Okay, okay, okay. You yeah, know, I'm good. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it, it could have gone a, a different way. I mean, uh, initially, when we analyzed it, we thought it was a good call. And, 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 yeah. and the people loved it. His, yep. his popularity ratings went yeah. up into the 60s. Right. Immediately after his meeting, yep. uh, he, he, mm-hmm. yeah, it was, it was not, not just the, the one in November, but then the, what, his first trip mm-hmm. to, yeah. wa- to uh, Washington in Mar a Lago, soaring. Uh, he would certainly love to see those numbers today yeah. uh, in terms of his popularity ratings, which are in the 30s right now. Right. Uh, but it, 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 it has not uh, delivered. And, there are, and because of the emptiness in the rest of the administration, there are not the long-term ties that have always been there for the Japanese mm-hmm. with, with so many friends of Japan inside particularly the State Department, but mostly in the Department right. of Defense, mm-hmm. that right. there were horizontal uh, communications channels that Japan has always relied on. So it's not just that Abe has be, be, was betrayed by Trump, but that there's nobody in the lower echelons for Japan to use that channel in order to get what it needs right. and, and, to get all, and to get itself exempted mm-hmm. from the tariff list. You, you know, the irony is, is that most of Japan's friends with the elite here in Tokyo have actually been on the Republican side. It hasn't been oh, on sure. my side. I, I'm, I'm a Democrat. It's been the Republican side who always had these hooks with Japan, and they're not there. Uh-huh. They're just not there, you know? Mm-hmm. And I think this has been frustrating yeah. for, for Nagata Cho. Uh, this, this session is going a little bit long. We need to revisit this issue. But before we wrap it up, just to play devil's advocate just a tiny bit, what if this is the new game that we play? What if... Um, this is what we have to deal with from now on, that it's going to be bilateral relationships, that it's going to be, the world is going to be dominated by a Game of Thrones rather than <laughs> the United States policing and being the, 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 the leader of the free world and that sort of thing. What if this is, in fact, just prelude? Well, I think we should get used to, have, to looking to Beijing for, for global leadership then. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think that's... that's in the pipeline. I mean, it's so so clear. I mean, when I went to the APEC meeting in Da Nang, I was stunned also that for the first time, my fourth APEC meeting was the first time that the Chinese were the keynote. It wasn't the United States. Not a first I was really amazed. And they had the longest speech, and it was all about yes. free trade, free economics, it's usually the speech that the Americans used to make. Well, look what they're doing in Africa. Oh, right? Absolutely. So, so there is initiative, there's, there's motivation, there's money behind it. Yep. Uh, there is a, a grand vision that, that you, know, you wouldn't expect anything less from the Chinese. Well, one belt, one road, mm-hmm. uh, which, is, which is moving out through Central Asia. I looked at it you know, close up firsthand as ambassador to the ADB, and I could see what, what was going on. And with the creation of the AIIB, which actually has more member states than the, than the ADB does at the moment. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, all of these things are an indication. You know, at Davos, who who was the leader of free trade and free market? It was the United States? Yeah. You know, it's it's astounding. So we we're going to have to get used to that, and um, something that I wouldn't want to get used to, but I think we we may have to. In, in other words, we may have to do this broadcast in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> President Donald Trump imposes trade sanctions on many of his trade partners. The repercussions are yet to be seen. Please stay tuned.